Okay. All right, guys, good morning. And I trust you are doing good. I want to welcome you to a second lecture on our advanced audit and financial um, audit and assurance class. Because I teach uh, reporting and nearly said reporting. Um, we've been trying to look ahead how our exams questions look like and trying to meet it. And we all know that audit begins with ethics. And so for the last meeting we met, we were doing ethics. Um, today, I want us to finish everything around ethics so that when we meet, we can actually start, again, we can actually start the audit planning in risk. All right, so we want to look at number one, we said, that the first questions that you are likely to face, you are likely to be faced with is actually the question of ethics and professional issues. Ethics and professional issues. Now, I said the other time in class that um, when you are asked this question of ethics and um, professional issue, there are areas you need to check. I gave you four. Today I'm increasing it and I'm grouping them into ethics. So when you are asked about ethical issues, you have ethics here. And when you are asked about professional issues, where you should look at. Now, when we talk about the ethics, there are four things that you have to remember in terms of answering your question. So we have number one, it comes threats to objectivity. Threat to objectivity, which we've done. If you remember, I went through Safi with you self-interest, self-review, advocacy, familiarity, I for intimidation. That is, that is it. Then another thing you can talk about is confidentiality. 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 If you have anything to tell, who do you tell? Do you tell anybody just like that. No, we, we did, we, we actually talked about the regulations around it. Um, if you have to tell the regulatory bodies, you have to, because confidentiality has a limit just as we discussed. So that that is something that you use to answer ethical questions. Another thing you talk, you, I made mention to you is about conflict of interest. Conflict of conflict of interest. Now, what this one is trying to say is that you are an audit firm, you have two or more, let's say two or more clients, two or more clients who are probably in the same industry. Now, what you are going to do is that the same audit procedure for one might be equal to the same modus procedure for the other. So, and another dangerous thing is that any information that you get in one side can be of an advantage and a disadvantage if you communicate to the other end. So it is very, very tricky if you are actually doing a practical audit, because if your client brings you a document and say that, give us your advice on it, know that the advice that you give to one person can be of a disadvantage to the competitor. And remember, one of the threats to objectivity is not being an advocate. It's not being an advocate. So you have to check that. Then the last thing you used to talk about uh, ethical issues is integrity of clients. Integrity of clients integrity of clients. 
is the client trustworthy? Is the client trustworthy? You have to check, you have to conduct your check. Now, when it comes to the professional issues, we have money laundering, which we've done already. We've actually spent time on money laundering. Now, when you are using money laundering, first of all, from where we've come to, you need to know the definition of money laundering, where criminals conceal their true source of illegal revenue. So you need to know that. Another thing you need to know is the three stages. Is the three stages, okay? So you talk about placement. You talked about placement. You also talked about layering. You also talked about um, integration. You've done all these things. So you might need to revise your manual to check and do a revision on it. Okay. Then in the same way, when you are talking about professional issues, another thing that comes up is also the liability of the auditor. Liability of the auditor. Liability of the auditor. Now, audit is risky. As a matter of fact, all those companies that have gone down were all audited. And most of them had their financial statement as declared by the auditors, true and fair. Yet they still went down. Now, auditor, the liability of the auditor or auditor's liability is trying to explain that the auditor is at risk of being sued. It's at risk of being sued. So how does he handle it? How does he handle it? Then the next thing that you use to talk, to answer questions or professional issues is practice management. This we've not done, practice management. practice management. So what I'm going to do is to instruct you to the manual that I gave you where you can find these things. Now, the manual I gave you, if you want to learn about the threat to objectivity, you go to page 61, okay, it's there. And uh, if you want to learn about confidentiality, go to page 85, it's in the manual. Conflict of interest is page, 89 okay yeah and that same place you'll be seeing the integrity of the client there but these these things apart from this one is technical it dealt with the technicalities of this this one is purely common sense even though you see this one too is purely common sense so when we also we also discuss money laundering and in your manual is on page 38 page 38, the auditor liability is on page 96, page 96, and practice management is on page, I think, 124. So you find all these things which will help you answer the questions. We've dealt massively with this. We've actually dealt massively when it comes to uh, threat to objectivity, actually dealt with that. Confidentiality, like I, I explained to you, also we dealt it with it when we were talking about the um, fundamental code of ethics. When, if you remember, it dealt with integrity, the IOPCP, it dealt with that. The C is the confidentiality, that is referred to here. Then the I is the integrity, but this time not on the auditor, it's on the client. So a reverse of it, all right? So you will be able to get your understanding on these things, this 
conflict. Conflict of interest too, it's purely common sense. You have two people you are working for. You have to check how you do it. I'll come back and give you um, some one or two tips on it. But um, let me quickly do a quick, a, a quick recap on what we did on the money laundry. Now, it's not just about the definition and the three stages. The most important thing is the auditor's response. The auditor's response. The auditor's action. What the auditor is meant to do. So let me let me introduce it here. And last week, if you remember, we solved the past questions. And in some of the questions, you saw it from it. Now the auditor's action when it comes to money laundering is that number one, the auditor is supposed to do KYC, know your client. Supposed to know your client. Supposed to know your client. Proper KYC. Not only knowing the client as in terms of the organogram and the ownership of the company, but you are supposed to also know where they get their money from where the company get their money from. My pen is too thick. Let me just reduce it. So you're supposed to know where they get their money from. And that is very, 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 very important. This aspect of it is very, very important. Number two, We talk about not tipping off the clients with the client when you suspect something. So no tip off, no tip off when there is a suspicion. And there is a suspicion, no tip off, okay? Well, when we talk about knowing your clients, basically what we are saying is that do due diligence. You remember the Chelsea issue? They said that due diligence should have that it should have been done on Abramovich. You know that he was part of the Kremlin. So that is so you have knowing your, your clients and where they source their money from. Number two is not tipping off the client when there is a suspicion. Number three is what actually we, we actually discussed last week, appointing a regulatory officer in your office, a money laundering reporting officer. This man will receive all the reports, but how does the staff even identify it? Is that they will need training. So you train your staff. You train your staff on how to spot and report money laundering. In fact, we realized the last time that when you evade tax, when you evade tax, it's money laundering. When you evade tax, you're actually doing money laundering. When you give bribes, that one too amounts to money laundering. Because nobody will show this, this, the true source of this money. Nobody will show the true source of this money. Another thing is that when you are politically exposed, this one is very tricky. So a pet, politically exposed person. Politically exposed person. We are not saying that anybody who is in politics is doing money laundering, no. But the moment you see that a person's status has changed, when he wasn't a politician and when he became a politician, there, it gives rise to suspicions of money laundering. It gives rise to that, okay? So we have people, especially in our country here, the, the, the amount of rise, as in the way they grow in terms of finances when they become politicians in a very short time, it, it, it gives suspicion that there is something going on in there. Okay, so 
when we get you get a question and the person who or the entity the any owner or a shareholder or a director is a politician it gives rise to a suspicion that the person might be doing money laundering. so spot these things when it comes to and and last week we realized that if the the majority of the transactions of the company are on cash basis are on cash basis you saw in last week's question that 75 percent of their revenue was on cash basis which which was a suspicious a suspicious thing why not use checks let the thing pass through the system so that we will see we also talked about betting betting you remember we also talked about complex transactions having foreign accounts foreign accounts so that transaction goes up and down just like that so all these things give rise to um money laundering so you train your staff to identify another thing let me add another thing is also when there is a multiple small multiplicity of small transactions i'm giving you all these things so that when you are giving a question a case study we should be able to spot all these things if you spot these things in your in your case study then it means that um there is likely to be money laundering so the last thing i want to add is a complicated group structure group structure so that that is that so when you're able to see all these things in the question then you should be able to write about it so you appoint a money laundering reporting us you train your staff to be able to spot these things and to report them then we are talking about um, reporting everything um, to the regulatory authorities regulatory authorities so we have economic commission of organized crimes Ghana, we have the IOKO. Council report to BOG and so forth. ICA is there, a professional body. Can report that to them. All right, so that one helps you to do with uh, the money laundering aspect of it. Okay. And like I said, if, if when it comes to the confidentiality we've already talked extensively on it we've already talked extensively on it and the conflict of interest is also a purely common sense as well as the integrity of clients which is also very very important okay so that is that as a matter of fact as a matter of fact there is a a standard. Oh, there is a standard that we need to talk about. And I want to quickly paint on that so that you can add that one to, to your pocket. All right, so let's let's quickly look at. So on page 46 of your manual um you were to look at it there is a standard they want us to quickly look at and that one is isa 250 
Sorry, I think I muted myself. Now, oh, what is this thing doing? Keep muting myself. Just want to share that page with you. Just a minute. Eh? All right, I'm back now. So um, let, let's consider ISA 250. ISA 250 is just talking about um, compliance to laws and regulations. Compliance to laws and regulations. So that is where you consider if there is anything that a company is not doing in terms of their compliance law and regulations, then the standard says that when you see that, report it now. So I start 250, compliance. And that is the reason why issues like money laundering has to be reported. Now, unfortunately, this one says that if you see any issue, if there is a breach, you report the breach to management. Now, but when it comes to mon uh, money laundering, you don't report to this management. You report to your own money laundering reporting officer who takes it up on to the next level because you might not have idea of how to even go about it. Okay, now, and if management is involved, then who do you report to? Management is involved in the non-compliance. Who then do you report to? Probably you need to report to a higher, you report to a higher authority. And here we are looking at probably the audit committee, audit committee. The reason why I wanted to bring this one up is because of the audit committee. Now, as part of corporate governance, the you know in UK, uh, US, they have the Sabah Oxlade Act 2002. But in the UK, we have the corporate governance code, which talks about an audit committee as part of corporate governance. Now, a quick revision is that when a, an audit committee is a committee that is set up to see to the financial controls in every entity. So these people have the function, they are, they are supposed to be independent and therefore they are made up of only non, so their composition is only non-executive directors, non-executive directors. Now, most of the time they say you can have a minimum of, a minimum of three nets, and their chairperson shouldn't be actually a member of this committee, okay? It's not a member of this committee. So you have this committee. Normally, this is where or who the internal auditor is meant to report to, not the management. Because other than that, there will be lack of independence. Now, what these people do is that they serve as independent people inside their own company. So they do independent verification of transactions, of transactions. Now it is this same audit committee that helps in the appointment of the external auditors, appointment of external auditors. Okay. 
So they are interest, they are they are men, they are also having the responsibility of having a responsibility of evaluating the internal control systems. So they set the internal control and they evaluate. So let me say set or formulate internal controls as well as evaluating them. Okay, so that is that. That is that. Corporate governance is that this committee are supposed to be reviewed every year. Okay, so these people also review financial statements. Okay, they also review the financial statements. They, they are the, the part of the board that determines the external auditor's fee and so on and so forth. Okay, so that is that. That is that. Now, my main focus here is that apart from the audit committee, I wanted to talk about which is a pure uh, audit and assurance class subject here. You just talk about it. If you see anything internally, report to the audit committee. What I wanted to also bring to your notice is that say a company is breaching the law, okay, not complying. What, what is going to happen? Remember, is this your at this level, we are talking about application. All right. So what you see that if the company is breaching laws, is breaching laws, what will happen is that number one, they are going to be fine. They are going to be fine. For example, if you are breaching GRA laws, penalties is going to accrue on you. So this one in the financial statement, you should be seeing fines. You should be seeing fines. What if they have not been caught and fined? So if they have not been caught and fined, then it means that the company should make a provision, a provision in the financial statement. If they don't, it means that the financial statement in, in its material uh, uh, respect may have some shortcomings, okay? Because I have witnessed companies whom GRA has audited and they are supposed to pay to Ghana 80 million Ghana cities. Imagine the company preparing its financial statement. So these things are normally for three years audit that GRA will conduct. Now, assuming the companies have been making profits and they be, they've been um, or let me say they've not been compliant or they've been breaking the laws, okay? And these provisions are not made in the financial statement just because they've not been caught yet. So if they are caught, fine, the fines will be there, it will be in the financial statement, you see, because they've not been caught yet. Supposing these companies are making revenue, having retained earnings seated in their books, let's say uh, for 100, million Ghana cities. And auditors have prepared their account, check that they are not compliant. So they ignore this part and just look at the figures in the financial statement. Remember we said that evidence in audits are persuasive other than conclusive. So they will give you receipts and everything backing these revenues that they've been making. Now, what will happen is that since this provision is never made in their financial statement to throw this profit down to let's say 20 million Ghana cities, because this one is omitted. If you see the company's financial statement being stated as true and fair, and you realize that there is an ongoing increase of retained earnings of 100 million Ghana cities, when these financial statements are projected out with the backing of the, the, the auditor, the auditor's opinion, you may have, you may go and invest in. Immediately the financial statement comes out and the auditor's opinion is published. GRA come to do their audit and 80 million is leaving them, which means they will be left with just 20 million. The fact that there is, they are not compliant, meaning mean that 
it is going to affect their retained earnings here, just as I've explained here. But another thing that I want to add, it is that it will affect. So this one, you see that IAS 37 is in play. So you look, you look around, okay, when you are reading the case study. And this one, you see that as the company's image is coming down, business risk, remember we discussed it last week, company's image is coming down, there is reputational damage, which is going to affect their going concern. Here we are looking at IAS1, okay, which is going to affect their going concern. It means that the business is gearing towards closure since they are non-compliant. Okay, so you look for these things in your um, case study and bring it out, okay? That is not. So you can use this one to talk about the fourth thing in ethics, which is integrity of clients. Integrity of client. Okay, ISA 250, laws and regulations, all right? So you can use this to explain further, depending on the mass that is allocated to it. So um, basically I've dealt with the threat to objectivity, confidentiality, conflict of interest. The conflict of interest, let's say somebody is, um, a, a firm is the auditor of, let me say, uh, uh, Samsung and probably Apple produces iPhone. Any information at one end, can serve as an advantage or disadvantage to the other. So you need, you may have to, you may have to even stop the audit. Okay, when you see conflict of interest. So let me give you some things to consider when there is conflict of interest. Conflict of interest. What is what will you do as an auditor? What will you do as an auditor? So. You are talking about conflict of interest. So you spot it in the case study. What can the auditor do actions? All right, now, if there is conflict of interest, then what you can do is that if you are going to audit those two companies, you have to send two different teams. Two different teams. Most most importantly, from different location, from different location. Okay, so we have an office in say Ghana, we have an office in Nigeria. If these two people are centered in Africa, Samsung, then we probably send two different teams. Maybe the Ghana one will be doing uh, the Samsung in another part of Africa, then the Nigeria one to be doing the Apple in another part. So you send two different teams, okay? Send two different teams. And you need to also say number two, you need to also send um, third parties to oversee the audit. So third parties, so that reviews are not done by the same partner who may be signing off these two audits. So third party, you use third party for overseeing and reviews. Okay. You may probably have to resign. We probably resign on one. You may probably resign on one, which probably will help you from all these issues of conflict of interest. Or you may have to inform the two uh, the two entities about the conflict that may arise. So we tell both entities of conflict. All right. So these are some of the things that you can do. You can do. All right. That is, that is it. And I think there is a, another thing, uh, probably you just have to read around. That one is fraud. Just read around it, just read around it. But let me spend the rest of the time to actually talk about the auditor liability. 
then I'll do a phrase page to talk about the practice management, which is purely common sense. So when it comes to the auditor, the liability of the auditor, So you can refer to page 97 of the manual I gave you. Um, the key bits are that we are talking about the risk of the auditor being sealed. So number one, what we look at is that who can sue the auditor? Who has the authority or the power to sue an auditor? Who can see? You look at number two. And how much that sewing can affect the auditor? How much the sewing can affect the auditor? Then lastly, we talk about what can the auditor do to reduce the liability? To reduce the liability. So who can sue the auditor? Of course, the auditor is appointed by shareholders. And if they don't do their work as needed, the shareholders can sue them. It's automatic. It's automatic because they owe them, you will come to that, then they, they owe them duty of care. Um, then if we know that the financial statement is for shareholders, but if they publish the financial statement and they put it in the graphic, anybody who sees it, can also take an advice from it and make some investment decisions. So third parties can also see. Third parties can also see. Only on the account that, number one, the, the auditors owe them duty of care. Duty of care. So they will have to prove that the auditors owe them duty of care, all right? You owe them duty of care. If you are an auditor, you are going to audit a company and you know that the financial statement that will come out, some individuals may be using it. Then at that point, you owe them due diligence. Okay, you already owe them due diligence. You know that the financial statement that will come out, your report that will come out, it will be interested aside the shareholder. Uh, shareholders, some people will be interested in it. You already owe them due diligence. So it means that as you are doing the audit and you're expressing your opinion, you should have them in mind. Okay, you should have them in mind. That is that is very, very important. So at the time of your opinion, you have to have those people in mind. Okay, because they are they are going to take reasonable action based on what you are going to put out. So you have to have them in mind. Okay, we've had cases um, of, of negligence. Negligence. So you have to know, and if you don't know, so those people that you, your liability can arise because you owe them duty of care at the time that you are going to issue your report. You might also not know which is the negligence aspect. Okay, so normally people sue the auditors for this negligence. These people must be able to prove that they have suffered losses because of your negligence, the auditor's negligence, all right? They must be able to prove that they suffered losses. Because of the auditor's negligence. And these losses must not be removed might not be, it should not be remote. It means that they are really affected by it. If they're able to prove all these things, negligence, the losses that they've suffered, measure it, then how it should not be remote, please. So let me bring in the not, not remote. It means it's so direct to them, it's so close to them. 
then it means that if the person is able to prove all these things must be proved the person is able to prove then the person has the right to sue the auditor okay that is that that is that how much that does that this affect the auditor in fact we know that if you are an auditor you can be fine can be fine. You've heard of cases of Enron in Arthur, Enron and Arthur Anderson. We are talking about going concern issues where your company can be collapsed. It can really, really affect the auditor. You may be able to suffer losses. So let me put predation losses and so many other things. You can, your license can be taken from you, all right? So these are the effect of those things. We've heard of, I read, I read I think somewhere last five months when I was teaching audit in the, in the UCC campus, uh, KPMG was fine, is it around $632 million in Dubai? If I remember correctly. So you 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 can go through a um, series of fines. Series of fines. Now, the most important thing here is this one. What can the auditor do to avoid it? Now, you can put a disclaimer. A disclaimer. Limiting those, the financial statement is for. So you can say that this financial report is for the shareholders, any other person who uses the financial statement to make any decision, the auditor will not be held liable. Okay, so that is that is that you can put a disclaimer on it. And these days, that's the common thing that people do. There is another one you can do, it's a limited liability partnership. You know, audits are mostly partnerships. PWC, PWC. These are price water coopers. These are different people that come in. Okay. Limited liability partnership. So you can put a cap on how, if there anything goes wrong, how you can be affected. Okay. So you see that here, apart from the, the fine liquidation and losses, the auditor can be approached personally to take away um, every asset that he has. So because of that, people want to prevent that by doing a limited liability partnership so that there is a cap on how much you can actually take from them when there is a loss, um, there is a case against them. Number three is that people have now been incorporating audit firms. So we are talking about incorporation. They incorporate it into a company. And as we know, a company is separated from its owners, okay? So anything happens, this is the firm, this is the firm. Now, there is another one, which is professional indemnity insurance. Professional indemnity insurance insurance we all know insurance is sharing of risk okay the sharing of risk so when the company is sued for a normal regulatory activity they can do professional indemnity insurance there is the, then there is a fidelity insurance that one is insurance against bribes and uh, money laundering and other things if you are not able to spot it and your audit firm is fine, these ones, it's the, the insurance that you do against them is what we call the fidelity. Fidelity. So this one looks like, the professional one looks like it's a normal, but this one goes to the extreme of bribes. Okay, that is what happened. And these days, people also do, and that is the last thing I want to bring on board, 
limited liability agreement with their clients. Limited liability agreement with their own client. If there is any of such, you can't sue me beyond a certain amount. Okay, they agree it before they sign the engagement letter. It is called limited liability agreement. All right, so let me use the rest of the time here to talk about the last bit, the last bit, which is practice management. Practice management. Practice management. Practice management. What is practice management? We are just talking about how an audit firm is run. Okay. How you manage an audit firm. So managing firm of accountants or an audit firm. Now, I'm going to group these ones into two. Number one is simple. If you are going to manage an audit firm, what you need to do is to look for clients. You need to obtain we are going to look at obtaining and accepting appointment. If you are running a company, you need to look for customers. And after you've looked and gotten some, number two of practice management is keeping the clients. It's keeping the clients. All right, keeping the clients. And here, uh, when we are talking about obtaining the client, we are going to look at number one, how do you look for clients? You are going to advertise. Number two, some people, um, you get them, they tell you to bring in your quotation for them to consider. We talked with, that one is called tendering. Tendering. Okay, then the last thing, uh, once you've had them, so it says obtaining and accepting. Once you have them, you consider pre appointment issues. Pre appointment issues. All right. These are the things you got. In terms of keeping the client, we will look at quality control quality control, all right? All right, so let's look at this quickly. Let's look at this quickly. If you are going to advertise, you are going to advertise, the standard says that you need to, so practice management, like I told you, you are looking at page one, two, four, the manual that I gave you. So advertisement, we say you let your adverts be clear enough. So we have seen clarity and accuracy. You cannot do any advert that is misleading. You shouldn't, you shouldn't mislead people, okay? And the advert, whatever you put in there should be true, it should be true. Another thing is that you should not make any unsubstantiated claims. No unsubstantiated Claims. For example, we are the best auditors in Ghana. How do you prove that? You can't prove that. So something that you cannot substantiate, you don't put in your advert. Of course, if possibly you've, you've won the best auditors award in Ghana, you can put it in there, or we won the best auditors, um, blah, 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 in Ghana, okay? So that that one will boost your, um, I mean, as you're advertising, people will know about you and they will deal with you. All right. So you don't put in any unsubstantiated claims. You don't put in any adverse comments. Adverse comments. Oh, we did. This is how we do it. Those other people, 
this is how they do it and it's not good, but we, this is how it is. No, you don't do that. It's not professional, okay? It's not professional. And your adverts should be professional. So we are talking about general professionalism. People will do adverts and kind of show some parts of their body and all those things. But when it comes to an auditor, everything has to be very, very professional. Other than that, people will see um, auditors as not being serious professionally. Probably another thing we should talk about is that we are in Ghana, so probably you want to use the ICA logo or something. No, you shouldn't do that. All you do is that probably you add that you belong to ICA, your ICA registered. All right, that is that is it. Okay, that is it. now in tendering the most important thing that uh, you will be looking at. Let me just add fees to this because if you are going to look for clients and accept them, fees are important. They are very 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 important. Now, if you are going to go for tendering, then it means that you have to put some things in your in your tender document that can actually help you um, kind of sort what the client needs. So you should be able to number one spot the need of the client, need of the client. Because you are going to tender for it, you are going to solve their problem. So you have to foresee their needs and state in your tendering document how you are going to solve them or help them deal with it. Okay, that is that is very, very, very important. Very, very important. So you have to, I mean, sort out. You definitely, you may have to put in there the fees because everybody wants to see the financial commitment that they have to make. All right, so that is fine. Now, pre-appointment issue, ISA 210. Talking about uh, what we just talked about already, the, mm, let's say, professional clearance. If you are, any audit firm that you are going, a client that you are going to meet who is not new in the system, which means they already had an auditor. So you have to consult the other auditor who is leaving to see if there are no issues and so that you can go on with your audit. And it's called professional clearance. Number two is that what we've just done, you need to check conflict of interest. You need to also check the integrity of a client, C of I, I or C. Um, you need to also check your resources. Do you have the resources? So in terms of finance, do you have the resources? In terms of um, staff, do you have it? See, these are common sense things. Um, I mean, if you are going to, why did you join this class in the first place? So the things you considered before joining this class might be some of the reasons why a client would choose um, an auditor, okay? So, and the same way, if you want, you are also the auditor, you choose a particular client, okay? So, and the fees do the same thing. But here, most importantly, the two things that we talked about um, is the key. Uh, we talked about contingency fee, which is not allowed. We see that run. Then we also talked about low balling. Low balling, charging a relatively lower amount just to get the clients. And this not actually having the staff and the resources by check. You just want to win the client. And so you lower your price up below what should actually be charged just for you to win the client. Okay, so that one to check. I mean, in terms of keeping the clients, you have quality control. We we're looking at quality control at the firm's level and quality control on the job, each individual job. on each job, okay. Quality control at the firm level. Yeah, we want to look at leadership. This is just to ensure quality, all right? You are controlling how your output is 
of high standard. So you check leadership, leadership, okay, leadership. So normally I saw on LinkedIn that a guy posted that, that he has been appointed as a, a quality control partner or officer. So, I mean, you need to have a quality control. You need to make somebody responsible for it. A quality control partner. And we are talking about HR issues. HR issues. So HR issues, we are talking about recruitment. And in, in big firms, your recruitment, your recruitment process are very rigorous. Move to one stage, another stage, another stage, another stage, yeah, just to um, get the best out of the lot. So that is that. Um, once you get the staff, you need to train them. If you want quality, you need to train them. So training, okay, training. Um, you need to also conduct performance review, performance review or performance evaluation. Um, of course, remuneration is very, very important. Remuneration. We have to pay them well. We have to meet their needs. Okay. These days, if you take a staff, get the person a nice place to stay, provide vehicle for the person, you see that the output is different. All right. So that that is it. Um, not only HR, you have to do the engagement performance. So as they are working. As they are working, you need to direct them. You need to supervise them. You need to review the work that they do. You have code review and hot review. All right, code review is when the work has finished, probably the files are lying down six months, three months, you go and pick them up to check if whoever did the work went through the organization's policy, okay? Organization policy. That is basically the work of the quality control. That brings in policy guidelines everybody must follow to meet the standard, okay? So the code review is when the work has been done, um, closed, you go and pick it up and review and check if the internal control procedures of the audit firm were followed during the audit. We have hot review. Hot review is a review that you do just before you issue your audit report, okay? All right, so, and quality control, the last thing is monitoring. Not only um, do you, so monitoring is kind of having a, a, a similarity with supervision, okay? So you actually monitor, you, you, you see where the job is going. If there is any evaluation that you do, you correct it, all right? So. You actually have your policy, they are doing the work. So you compare their, their performance with their policy and if there is any control um, you put in place. Now quality as, uh, control on the specific job. Um, we say that when you give the job, you have to sign the audit plan and strategy. And strategy. Audit plan is the overall, oh, sorry, the strategy is the overall, the plan is the detailed um, description of how you are going to do the job. So it has to be signed, the planning has to be signed so that by your supervisor before you even start the work. Now, when you are on the work, you are directed, you are supervised, and review has to be done. Okay, at any point in stay. Okay, all right. Then number three, what you can also do is provide suitable consultations. Consultations. Then before the reports come out, you mentioned hot review. Hot review. Okay, and you we also have to document all the processes documentation is key document all the processes that you go through to through to writing your report and indeed uh, you cannot do away with delegation you may have to delegate work but you have to be careful uh, you don't most of the time uh, 
work is delegated to kind of the hardworking person. Everybody delegates, everybody delegates. By the time as the person is even overwhelmed and keeps making mistakes. So you, you need to check how you delegate to people. So ladies and gentlemen, um, this is how you go about answering um, ethical and professional questions, okay? So in summary, uh, in terms of us ask, ask, um, answering these questions, I said ethics or ethical considerations and professional considerations. Okay, here we talked about threats, threats to objectivity. Don't forget threat to objectivity and the SAFI, we dealt extensively with it. Talk about confidentiality. Confidentiality. Talk about conflict of interest. Then integrity of clients. All right, integrity of clients. Okay, when it comes to the professional bits, money laundering, talked about that. Professional liability or auditor's liability. Okay, talked about that. Then practice management, practice management. All right, so that end our class. And now you should be able to solve your first questions on ethics. Normally it comes in 20 mark questions. So next week when we meet, we will take a question. So Saturday we'll meet 6 p.m., take a question. And that embodies all these things that we've discussed. Try and fish them out. Um, then we are good to go. So on our next video class, we will be talking about audit planning and risk. Okay, all right. So revise, 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 revise. Practice, practice, practice. That is the only way to go. Okay. So see you guys on Saturday where we solve the examples. God bless you and see you soon.